did they did they get new teachers this year for the like for the isc program or are they continuing the old ones or something i mean upgraded or kind of promoted the CV. some we got new but there are still some that are the same okay How has lockdown been for you? Um, I'd say good. I mean, I have pretty much not left my house at all, except for like the one one time when I moved from Mumbai to Pune. So I am now in Pune, right? Yeah. So besides that, it's like pretty much been at home. But that's kind of how it was for me even before that. Other than going to school, most of my work is kind of done from home. So it's not a not a big like impediment or obstacle or anything. So did you binge more or you studied more? I mean, um, honestly, I don't usually binge a lot. I just really watch stuff while eating because that's like multitasking. You know, I can <laughs> do two things at once, so I save time that way. So I would say, I mean, I wouldn't really call it studying because I'm not really like studying. It's more like I just call it work instead because that sounds better. And I'm not necessarily like learning new things. I'm doing new things, so that's that makes it work. as opposed to studying okay so uh, we should begin in another 10 minutes hmm?
Uh, everybody will be starting in another five minutes. Okay, so before we start, Hardik, are you like scared to join Stanford? Like, what's that feeling? Um, scared? I wouldn't say so, um, because I've actually been talking to a lot of other students already. I mean, reaching out to them on wherever I can, whether that's LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook. And I mean, regardless of what it may seem like that, like there are a bunch of other overachievers there. 
Zoom को सा नहीं है हम ही म्यूट हैं वो इवन ओके एनीवे so um yeah although it might seem intimidating in the sense that you're thinking there are a bunch of other overachievers there who are like better at you better than you at pretty much everything there is on the face of this earth um that kind of does not change the fact that they are still humans and that you are also better than them at some stuff right and as much as you want to learn from them about the stuff that they are better at they also want to learn from you about the stuff you are better at so when it comes down to that and when you look at it that way rather than being intimidating it kind of becomes more i mean interesting and inviting in the sense that you want to go there as soon as possible so that you can learn as much as possible in your in your four years of time there so that's not a lot of time even though it may seem like it so i think excited would be a better word rather than rather than i mean intimidated definitely So we're ready to start. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to HiQ's very first interactive webinar. I am Manav Garwal. the co-founder of the hiq club and this my partner is adit padde the other co-founder we are really excited to share with you what we have in store for you today but before that i'd like to introduce our team at hiq we have meeka thorani aastha roy sneha shirorkar shreya bakhari and sanya deshmukh over to you adit what we aim to do at hiq is get motivational speakers who have achieved greatness in their own fields and talk to them about their journey and the hurdles they have faced how are we different from a podcast or a ted talk simple we are interactive our speakers are right here with us and are ready to answer anything you want to ask them about their achievements hiq club is our initiative to bring together friends and mutuals and create a close knit faction that promotes greatness and all our speakers are acquaintances and friends to show that greatness is within our reach so our first speaker who depicts greatness we have with us hardik patel but before we begin i would really appreciate that all of you could keep your videos on and um, the chat box will be open for questions please welcome hardik patel hi everyone um thank you so much for having me today i understand that sunday evenings um everybody would prefer to spend them in a different way whether that's on your bed binging netflix or something like that um but i'm really happy that all of you are here today um i'm hardik patel as you as all of you know i'm an incoming freshman at stanford university two years ago um as a matter of fact since most of you are from vidya valley i should mention in case you are i mean not aware i actually graduated from vidya valley two years ago in 2018 um and i'll be going on to stanford university now this this upcoming year and studying management science and engineering along with potentially symbolic systems but um, that's something i'll have to really kind of decide as i go along it's going to be a exciting journey that way um in terms of my i'd say professional or career interests i'm interested in entrepreneurship that's my first priority but besides that i'm also interested in venture capital private equity management consulting and and a uh, product management i'd say something like um, all the fields that are both human facing and tech facing at the same time so that's what i'm interested in um so yeah i mean i'd be um happy to i'm happy to be here and answer all of the questions that the panel has prepared for me and also kind of respond to your queries towards the end thank you ardik now uh, asan i will start with a few questions Okay, so uh, as we can see, there are many factors which affect a student's application. But if you could summarize, what do you think was unique in your application that made you stand out from rest of the applicants? Right. Um, that's an excellent question. And um, before I start answering that question in terms of what was special about my application, I should actually really mention that a vast majority of candidates who apply to, I mean, uh, top or elite. 
universities, whether it's in the US or UK or um, in more holistic admissions colleges in India, um, a vast number of them are really absolutely qualified to get in. So it's not really a matter of are you qualified or not qualified, but it's a matter of how special or how rare are your qualifications. And that's pretty much just the focus of the question that Man asked me right now, what was unique about my application? Um, so in my case, uh, what was unique was really something that I did not think I would be pursuing at all, simply because it's so, so random and out of the blue, but it was um, road safety. And that's, like I said, absolutely random. Uh, probably no student kind of engages in this, in this field of road safety, but I did anyway. And I think I can talk, a, say a little bit about how I really got into that. Um, what I was trying to do when uh, trying to create a good or well-rounded or developed application for my uh, admissions was trying to find some research opportunities where I could really put my skills to the test. Uh, now, naturally, most of these um, are research opportunities with um, like university professors or members of faculty that way. But I had quite a hard time finding them. And I think that's, that's a natural trend that we see across the board, not just here, but everywhere, simply because um, there are a lot of things that high schoolers can't do. And it's not very useful to bring them on as research assistants or research fellows. So what I did instead was pretty much just looked all over the internet. And I found this one open source data set available on the, on the state transport department's website about um, road accident statistics in the state of Maharashtra. And I started with them. And I kind of used whatever skills I had in data science using, using R and data visualizations and all of that. And I put together a small kind of research project and I was able to take a reverse approach. And then rather than approaching the government and asking them to give me an assignment, I actually did the assignment first and then went to the government and I showed them, look at this, this is what I've done. And um, they actually ended up liking it. I, I sent it to the transport commissioner and the joint transport commissioner for road safety. And they liked that work and uh, appreciated it quite a bit, which is why I thought, I mean, I can really, I can really make this much bigger than it is right now. And nobody's engaging with this. This is a problem. It's an active problem. And um, it's quite neglected, not just by students like myself, but by, by like the society and community at large in general. So on the basis of that, I actually uh, created a lot of content. So I actually have uh, this one documentary that I've created. Um, I've not really filmed it, of course, because I'm not, a, I'm not a cinematic arts person myself, but I was able to get help from others and film that, conceptualize it, put it together. I've actually created a lot of um, resources and educational books for children, as well as for adults and students uh, by which, uh, through which they can really learn about road safety and the things that they don't really know, or even the school school road safety and transport regulations that uh, school teachers and administrators are not known about, uh, aren't aware about. So once again, from there, I took another step forward and actually conducted awareness campaigns through which I reached over 350 different teachers across um, more, I'd say, suburban and rural areas of Maharashtra. So that was in um, Thane, Kalyan, Dombivli, Nashik, and Hemadnagar. So I reached about 350 teachers from there and like, therefore through them reached a much larger student body. Um, so those are some of the things I did. And then beyond that, um, another thing I thought was all of this is great. I'm definitely making a social impact, but this is, this may not be the absolute best use of my technical skills, which is why I actually, um, went out and really decided to kind of take matters in my own hands, I'd say. And I um, created these two products or devices, which are now covered under three design patents. And I'm working with the state government even now um, to kind of mandate these. Um, I think we can, we can give you a link towards the end so that you can really read about what they are in detail and understand what it's about. I won't take too much of time delving into the, the deep, deep details about this, but yeah, so we're really, in the process of taking that further. Of course, all of this is currently on hold for now, simply because, um, because of the pandemic, uh, one good result was that road transport reduced a lot, which means road accidents reduced a lot. So that's not anybody's main priority as of this moment, but on some day it will resume. And on that day, I'm, I'm ready to get back into action. Thank you, Arjit. Um Okay, so next question. 
Uh, we all know that essays play a very important role in an role in an application as they help the university to get to know about you. What did your common application essay and Stanford essays revolve around? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, one of the most important parts of the of the application process in the U.S. is essays because they highlight what you have done in a very non-objective fashion. So they let you tell your story in your own words, which is very, very important. Um, so really, um, I mean, I don't think I would um, say that there is one specific type of essay which works or another that doesn't. It really depends on your personal style and how you want to showcase your story. In my case, I actually used uh, a, an example in my common app essay from Greek mythology. Um, which quite, quite interestingly, I learned about while, if I'm not wrong, probably in fifth, sixth, seventh grade while reading Percy Jackson or something like that, right? So uh, that example was about um, Sisyphus, who was uh, uh, an evil Greek king. And he was actually cursed by Hades to roll up a huge boulder up a hill all the time for eternity, for his entire life. And he had to roll the boulder up. And... He could not reach the top. It was just not possible. No matter how high he reached, it will eventually roll back down and he has to restart. Right. And that's often perceived as a curse because, because the way we're all conditioned is to believe that um, the final destination has to be some sort of success point. You know, the peak, the peak of the mountain is where everybody wants to be. A lot of people don't really appreciate the process of reaching there. So what really I was saying, trying to say in my essay was that that wasn't really a curse at all. That was a boon because if he had been able to reach the top, then he'd reach the top, see the view once, admire the view once, and then he'd get bored after that. Maybe he'd do it again, maybe twice, maybe thrice, maybe four times, maybe 50 times, maybe 100 times, but eventually he'd get bored, right? Because once you go to the top, there is nothing to do. There's no active work involved. You just have to look around and be happy with what you have. As opposed to that, pushing a boulder up actually requires a lot of labor. It requires a lot of effort. It requires grit. It requires perseverance. And that's a much, much more active pursuit that you have to really put your heart and soul into. So that, that was kind of the example that I put in place while talking about um, how important it really was to um, fail and that getting to that final point of success should not really be the benchmark for the things we do or the things we aspire to do um, in life. So that was kind of what my common app essay revolved around. Um, now Stanford actually has um, 11 different essays. So I naturally can't get into a, a lot of very, very, um, I'd say intricate detail about that. But once again, I'll say that the key, key goal or key aspect of this is to tell your story. And it's not to tell one story or one occurrence or one incident that you had in your life. It's not to say that I failed this exam and then I studied hard and then I passed it, right? That one instance is just an example of, should be your example for everything that you have done throughout to say that this is just one example, but this is what I've done throughout everywhere else. And that's why I am where I am. So, um, in fact, if I had to highlight one quote, I think, I think I highlighted this quote in my, um, in, in the teaser video that we shot earlier, a couple of days ago, um, I actually said this in my common app essay itself, um, uh, once again, to like, try to be less boastful, but still, uh, it was the, the reason I believe I'm successful is because I've failed more often than other people have even tried. Right. So, so that's, that's pretty much the, the ethos of mine. And the key is just to find your own ethos and project it such that you're telling your entire story in just one little glimpse. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you please explain the importance of an internship? Um, sure. So, um, for all of you that are not aware, I actually um, was involved in an internship at LNT, which is Larson and Tubro's, their electrical and automation wing. So I was I was a research intern, research and development intern, more like at at a factory that they had where they manufactured electrical components. So just for a little bit of background, these electrical components are MCBs, which are miniature circuit breakers. They're present in pretty much everybody's house today. I'm sure most of you already know where they are in your house. If you do not, you should actually try to find out. Um, 
so that's that's really what i was doing and i had absolutely no idea how any of this really worked i mean besides the basic functioning of an mcb how how a factory worked or or industrial processes or anything like that before before i went for this internship right um now once again just to start with i'll i'll list out a few things that i did at this internship and how those were valuable to me right so um having studied at a school and all of that doesn't really give you a sense of the kind of professional environment or a corporate environment that you will eventually work in for the majority of your life right because um in the end education lasts for about 20 years of your life but the 50 years after that are just you working on your own and it's it's quite important that you get a sense of what you're doing or what you're getting into so that you know what you like and what you do not like so an internship is just one of the many ways to do that um personally people ask me a lot of times what did you learn from this internship and they expect me to say things like oh i learned how to kind of manage factory workflows or oh i learned how to write research reports all of that is absolutely false i'll tell you what i mean i did learn those sure but that wasn't really the most important thing i learned the most important thing i learned was that i never want to work at a large company again ever in my life right and that may not be the case for you maybe maybe you'd you'd do exactly what i did and you'd love it but that wasn't the case for me i really understood and fully fully like wrapped my head around the fact that this corporate environment and almost a <laughs> bureaucratic environment is not something that i would thrive in i want to work in something very very fast paced very scrappy and that's really how i validated and confirmed the fact that i was interested in entrepreneurship so by not doing entrepreneurship i really found out that entrepreneurship is what i want to do and now that's just one example um, of something and besides that now in terms of the real technical stuff that i did at the internship i actually um, wrote wrote a research paper over there a research report you can say um about this one specific physical process which is done by humans um in an mcb right so they have actual like hundreds of workers who are physically taking screw drivers and making turns in them so that your mcb can save your life in case of an emergency at home now that's obviously not very reliable and i think most of you will agree and the testing method for that is pretty much just trial and error it's like you do it you test it you hope it works if it doesn't work you just get it back and try to do it again until it does and that's obviously like i said it's not very efficient it's not very fool proof so um what i did was i suggested i had no idea why i thought this what happened was i had a sprain in my leg that one day and i went to get an x ray because i did i just wanted to make sure it wasn't anything serious and i saw the x ray and i realized why are they doing this manually when they can test it through x rays right now obviously it it requires some amount of technical knowledge to realize that x rays would have worked in this case which you would have if you if you did the bad internship alongside me right but i realized that and i suggested x ray testing and they actually tried it out and it somehow managed to work and they realized oh this x ray stuff works what we are spending like hours and hours of time on gets done in basically 3 or 4 seconds now and it's almost entirely like can be automated so it's it can be made autonomous and i i believe they are or they have gone on to work on implementing that kind of x ray testing in in all of their stuff so i was actually happy that i was able to contribute to some contribute to the company in some way even after even after i left from there um so that was a little bit about what i did now of course doing this technical work definitely did help me understand how exactly i can really contribute to a company as well um but in general if you had to ask me in one sentence is an internship essential i would say no it's not essential right does it help it definitely helps i mean doing something is better than doing nothing right i think that goes without saying but i think in general it's a it's a false premise or somewhat of a myth that doing an internship is absolutely essential or necessary to get into a good university abroad or anything that's not really the case it depends on your personal interest if you are interested in academic research by all means go ahead and do that if you are more interested in working for social causes then once again they should be internship leave that aside and do what you really want to do right because once again like i said the key is to do something uh, unique and do something different mm-hmm. everybody can do an internship right mm-hmm. what is it about what you do that only you can do it why is nobody else qualified to do what it is you do right and that's the whole question once you can answer that question you can get through pretty much anything
that was quite long i'm sorry about that uh, that was that's all right so many of the viewers i'm sure they have this question um how did you get into the internship and what was the procedure of it um yeah that's that's a that's a good question um i'm going to be completely honest here and tell you that in most cases at least in india it's not exactly possible for you to get internships out of cold emails at least as a high schooler right naturally they they do take college students um but as a high schooler that's not very easy there aren't really open applications anywhere and even when there aren't open applications it's not like you can email hr and just ask them please give me an internship and they will right so i had to really do what pretty much everybody has to do in this case and you know go ahead with necessary with the necessary evil of going through um, some kind of contacts or connections or networks that i had established there so uh, my father happened to know the the factory manager at lnt and so i was really able to reach out through him and kind of get in through a back door you can say right so so that's that's kind of what happened um i just had a comment in or uh, saying please explain cold emails if possible i'll just get i'll just get to that so um naturally that that is a problem with internship and just just to give you a scale of um when i say it's not really possible to get these internships on your own just to give you a scale of how severe that problem is even when i got into this internship through a contact with the factory manager i had to actually go to the hr and formalize the the legal proceedings to say that oh you're working here this is the certificate that you're going to get towards the end right and the member of hr there was honestly not even aware if he was legally permitted to put me on the payroll even though i was not getting i was an unpaid intern even then he was not sure if it was legal to hire me because i was below the age of 18 right and i had to actually go home <laughs> print out pages of the if i'm not wrong child and adolescent labor regulation and protection act highlight those necessary clauses and take it to him and kind of sit down with him and work it out and say um, according to this it should be working because this is not these are not hazardous conditions i'm not being forced to do this i'm working below a specific number of hours every week and so on and eventually that did work out but you you're going to have to do stuff like this eventually or once in a while um <laughs> to really get through and um make use of all the opportunities that are provided to you right so like i said eventually it worked out so it's it's all fine um and yes i will i'll i'll talk about cold emails for a second cold emails is essentially just um randomly emailing people even when you don't know them previously asking them for opportunities or asking them for help or just wanting to talk to them and learn about them and about the work they do um once again i see that I honestly did not know about cold emails that much when I was when I was um, in my college application process. I learned about it, learned about it much much later, possibly just two or three months ago, or how to do it effectively. Um, so we kind of tend to, um, I'd say, not emails so much, but they're actually very important in the sense that you are actually setting up a system where somebody doesn't need to be privileged. as in have those contacts or connections in order to get opportunities or resources that they deserve right so through cold emails what it means is you are you are randomly emailing people and reaching out to them for help and they are doing that and they may say no you are not qualified for this job and that's all right but it shouldn't be a case where having a contact or connection or having friends in high places is the only way to kind of get opportunities so that's what cold email is um i think if you all if you all just can go back and like google what is a cold email or how to cold email or subject lines for cold emails you'll get a lot of different articles written by uh, top uh, news sources whether that's forbes or business insider and so on which tell you how to do this effectively through which you can actually scour for opportunities whether it's reaching out to university professors or or people in corporate organizations asking for internships or so on and it's something i'll definitely encourage you to do um cold emailing as much as possible simply because the worst thing that can happen is that they either ignore ignore your email and don't respond to it and uh, the other worst thing that can happen to you is they say they they respond to your email and say unfortunately we're not able to offer you this opportunity or position and that's not really such a such a big issue because um the truth is if you cold email 100 people you don't need opportunities from all 100 of them right you just need one opportunity so getting one out of 100 naturally shouldn't be so difficult so it's it's worth the effort if if you're getting that opportunity organically is what i'll say 
and uh, just a quick question that i got i'll answer i can answer this in one word in the comments from priyansh which is did you apply early or regular and the answer is i applied regular and and i'll come back and explain what early and regular is in case some of you want to know later Uh, Asta, over to you. So, yeah. So you mentioned in your portfolio that you're an aspiring entrepreneur. So what are the most basic things one should have or try to acquire to be an entrepreneur, and how do you be consistent? Yeah. Um. Yes, that's a that's a good specific question in terms of what you can do to kind of um get into entrepreneurship or enter enter like similar fields where you're kind of doing something on your own. um the first key the first major key to that is really communication because unlike in a lot of different places your technic in entrepreneurship your technical skills will matter much less than how well you talk to people and deal with them right because let's say hypothetically i'm going to start facebook today and it doesn't exist right now the thing is i can't code facebook alone right regardless of how good i am as a programmer i can't code facebook alone and if if you all know about it that didn't happen in case of mark zuckerberg either or maybe you can code facebook alone but there's still somebody who's going to have to look at the business end of thing there's still somebody who's going to have to look at the legal end of thing there's still somebody who's going to have to market your product right and you can't possibly do all of that alone so in short what i'll say is your technical skills are almost deemed irrelevant if you can't build a good team and work with them very very effectively so communication is really the number one thing you should be working on right and one of those one of the things that involves is really talking to pretty much anybody you ever possibly meet right because um you never know how you can be of help to them later or how they can be of help to you right and that uh, that definitely works i'll just just as a simple example that i can give you um earlier last month i i just cold emailed this one person that i saw on linkedin i just saw his profile there i thought it was interesting so i cold emailed him and um so on his profile i realized he's he's interested in quant quantitative finance right and i had some resources and links about quantitative finance that i had so i just cold messaged him and i told him i like your profile is impressive i like it i have these resources for quant finance if you'd like right approximately a month later he actually messaged i mean he messaged me back and we exchanged messages back and forth then but the conversation stopped there but about a month later he actually messaged me back about a fellowship um in venture capital that i eventually went on to apply for right i still haven't heard back about the fellowship but what's it's not important whether i got into that fellowship or didn't that's an entirely different entirely different concept but um it's really important to talk to people so that you can really give and take ideas and concepts and so on and as they say if if man and i each have 1 dollar and we exchange them we'll still have 1 dollar each right but if man and i have one idea each and we exchange them now each of us have two ideas it multiplies ideas and concepts and thoughts they multiply so you should definitely do that as much as possible and and the third thing it's pretty much that's i'd say in a way is quite um i'd say generic advice it really works anywhere you can't really at all go wrong with that um and that's that's reading a lot reading as much as you can and reading about um things that you love right now uh, reading doesn't mean that you have to um read like big thick 800 page novels it doesn't mean you have to buy steve jobs biography and like lug it around everywhere you go in your bag uh, and i did that at one point of time um, but it doesn't mean you have to do that it means you can it you can read medium articles right it means you can read like in shorts which are those 60 60 word uh, news news pieces that you get now on an app on your phone so there are a lot of different ways you can engage with that kind of content but it's very important that you consume as much knowledge as you can um because eventually that helps you a lot regardless of whether your you can see like a direct application from that knowledge or not and once again i'll i'll quote a little bit of an example here um of of this is not my personal example this is uh, steve jobs in this case since i mentioned that where uh, when steve jobs was in university at reed college um he was i believe initially studying something else but then eventually got bored of it and then went to a went to a temple or ashram in india and then 
went back there and started studying calligraphy and nobody really understood why everybody was thinking man why is this guy studying calligraphy how is that going to help him at all right and this was a time i mean most of us obviously weren't born i i think all the parents here were if if there are any but it was at that time where computers or personal computing didn't really exist as a concept but because steve jobs took this calligraphy class why fonts exist today on computers because he learned from that calligraphy class and eventually went on to create the typeface for the first mac computer that he built um using his knowledge of calligraphy and if he wouldn't have taken that class then those fonts possibly would not exist today you would have to write everything in one single font right which is not very interesting naturally um so so it definitely helps even to learn things that um you're interested in even though it may not seem immediately useful to you today because really the point is um you don't have to kind of conquer the world today you don't have to apply what you learned today like in the same day as long as you are able to apply it in your uh, hopefully long life of 100 years then like it's perfectly fine and it's going to be a very very useful um contribution to the world yeah that's i think i believe you're majoring in management and engineering so could you tell us more about your course yeah so i'm i'm majoring in management science and engineering um what that is effectively is a somewhat of a blend or a hybrid between um computer science engineering business and public policy um in short if i had to say it in one sentence it's really entrepreneurship in a degree right that's what it is because it's once again it's teaching you the technical skills it's teaching you the business and marketing end of things through the business administration um, aspect of it and it's also teaching you public policy because now that's becoming uh, an increasing increasing area of concern simply because of the amount of regulation and the government intervention that is creeping into um, a lot of different enterprises and ventures right so, so that's what i'm doing um alongside that this is something i probably i mean came up with or thought of very recently i'm also studying this other uh, potentially looking at studying this other major which is called symbolic systems um this is something that is uh, exclusive and specific to stanford i'll just say one or two lines about that as well symbolic systems is a i'd say somewhat of a blend of like artificial intelligence and in computer science human computer interaction and then absolutely random stuff like linguistics philosophy psychology and politics right and a lot of people are concerned about how does this even tie together how is artificial intelligence related to linguistics right but um a lot of other degrees what they do is they tell you how to do something right like management science and engineering indirectly tells you how to be an entrepreneur but what symbolic systems teaches you is the why to do something right so why should you be doing this and that's the more of the philosophy and psychology aspect of it why you should be doing something and that's a lot more important and it's a much much more critical question that anybody should be answering with respect to anything that they're doing because it's it's possible to eventually figure out how to do something right like once again going back to the same example if i don't know how to code i can find somebody who does or i can learn it myself right but if i don't know what i'm coding or why i'm doing that then i'm pretty much just going to sit at a computer all day with absolutely no idea what i'm doing right so understanding the why to do something is just as important or i'd say even more important than understanding the how to do something so that's that's what i'll say also uh, could you walk me through the admission process and the interview that usually takes place to get into a college right um yeah now now once again contrary to popular popular belief this interview that takes place at least i'm not talking about uk college I have absolutely no experience about that so you should probably not apply this advice there but in terms of us universities the interview that takes place is almost entirely irrelevant to say the least right really what it is is an informational interview it's for you to learn about the university and about their campus and about their environment and their student life just as much as they want to learn about you and this there's one very very simple reason about why this interview is not given so much importance and that simple reason is that there are going to be thousands of different interviewers interviewing like hundreds of thousands of different candidates right there's absolutely zero ways to standardize that some interviewers are going to be very very harsh and very very strict and they're going to go in there with high high expectations and if the student <laughs> um like has a slip of tongue once or like stutters once they'll have they'll have a problem with that right and there are some who are going to be uh, something like 
the kind of souls on earth and even if the even if the student makes a mistake they are going to kind of write very very good reports for that student right not to say that one is better than the other or one is more favorable or anything like that but that's why interviews are not given a lot of weightage in fact 80 i'd not even say 80 probably 90 to 95% of interviews don't really make a difference in your admissions decision right the 5% of interviews that do make a decision uh, do make a difference in your admissions decision are really making a decision uh, difference because you said something like terribly wrong right or you did something terribly wrong um let's say hypothetically um possibly you may have you may have said something maybe you maybe said something racist or maybe you said something sexist right or uh, comments like that in your interview so naturally those are disqualifying factors and that's very very clear they're not going to give it second thought if you do something like that and nor should they right so that's that's kind of what it is um so that's a little, little bit about the interview i had interviews for most of my most of my sorry not most of my universities i only had interviews for four of my universities that i applied to um just in case you you want to know i had an interview for princeton i had an interview for yale i had an interview for upenn which is the university of pennsylvania and for stanford right and i can tell you almost like in a guaranteed manner that my stanford interview was the worst out of all of these and i'm not saying it was bad it was just relatively the worst right and my yale interview was by far the best let me just tell you i got rejected at all three of the other universities at yale upenn and princeton and i was accepted to stanford right so once again i will say the interview is not as important as people think it is but at the same time that does not mean you should go in without preparation in case you are you are really aspiring to get there um it's important to do your best and put your best foot forward regardless of whether it may or may not count in the in the final picture right and um asta just to just to check in uh am i also i mean would you also like me to speak about the overall process of like an application or just or did you just want me to say about the interview the admission process also okay all right so um i mean just just a brief um note about what what's kind of required is naturally um you will fill up a common application which is uh, i mean you will just find that online there are a few set of questions that they'll ask about your bag your personal background um educational as well as family background um that along with the essays like we just talked about previously um and besides that that there is that one interview which definitely does count a little bit maybe not so much depending on university to university and that once you submit that that's pretty much kind of it um you'll hear back in a few months or a few weeks depending on which college you apply to and what cycle you apply in um so so that's a little bit um in terms of the application process if you have any very specific if anybody else like in the audience has any very specific questions about this i'll i'll get to them towards the end once we are kind of done with the the panelist questions um and yeah there is there is one thing which gets ignored very very often and i genuinely don't understand why and those are letters of recommendation i cannot possibly stress how important letters of recommendation are because that is the one part of your application which is written by somebody other than yourself right naturally when you are writing about yourself you are not going to write bad things you are not going to say that you are an unqualified candidate or an unfit candidate or that you're going to be a nuisance to the faculty or that you're going to kind of create a ruckus in the dorms you're not going to say that you're going to say good things about yourself you're going to talk about all your achievements and your accomplishments but the letter of recommendation is one thing which is going to be very very unbiased because it comes from somebody who knows you and somebody who's a third party right so building good connections with your teachers and building good rapport with your teachers not just for the sake of letter of recommendation i wouldn't say that but in general because that's a very very important thing to do um is is very very important i still um to do, do check in with my teachers at vidya valley once in a while um and i mean talk to them and wish them on teachers day and on and on common holidays and stuff like that so that's just one example but but those letters of recommendation are 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 extremely important and you should not neglect their their relevance so i wanted to know that in india gap year is not very uh, people don't appreciate gap year so how did your family support you when you said you wanted the gap year and throughout the entire process of getting into stanford um yeah just just before i start that i'm i'm seeing a bunch of questions um rolling in in the in the chat and i will i'll definitely get to them towards the end so that i can keep the panelist flow going right um so yeah this is a this is a question about how did my family support me through this entire process and more specifically towards uh, during the gap year right that's a great question um 
now this will obviously depend a lot on your personal context in terms of um i mean how how you really kind of fit in and how uh, cohesive and i mean the roles you have in your in your family structure right so uh, what i can say is really only about my own personal experiences um in terms of a gap year i wasn't really considering one initially to be honest it was not something that i wanted to do or it was not really something that i that i looked forward to right i was hoping that i'd get to go this year but a lot changed because of the pandemic and um that actually created a uh, uh i mean in general at least among myself and my parents we were quite certain that taking a gap year was the best way forward uh, we didn't i didn't really face a lot of resistance or we didn't really have to go through a lot of debate there um really what happened was in terms of um whether i mean i had to navigate three or four things at a time right it's it's the simple i mean the health concerns or the healthcare concerns that arise when you go to a country like the us which is not really dealing very well with the pandemic right now and along with that it's i have to navigate the travel restrictions which are existent in in my state or or in our country in maharashtra or in india i also have to deal with the travel restrictions that, that exist in the us i also have to deal with the visa restrictions that come into place right and i also have to deal with the university restrictions that come into place and really to get a good result out of this what meant what it meant was i had to get all five of these things absolutely spot on and favorable for me in one go at one time and that's that's obviously not very easy to do because i unfortunately i can't really control our foreign policy or theirs um so uh, that that's why it was it was seemingly obvious to me that taking a gap year was the best way forward but once again it will depend a lot from student to student now i was confident taking a gap year because um i'll go ahead and say that throughout throughout this entire um, i mean whatever two years or four years or the time before that i've pretty much been uh, doing most things on my own so that's really on my own time or through my own initiative right and i haven't needed any sort of formal structures or guidelines to kind of put me through a process right and it's it's not bad or anything to require them but some people do require them and some people do not it's like some people would um do much better in a in a school condition where everything is taught to them by a teacher where they're fitting into a formal timetable and schedule and other people would kind of do better when they come back home and get their own time to study how they want at their own pace at their own schedule right um so that's that's really a thing that depends from person to person in my case it was obvious to me that i could really um work out this entire year without the formal structure which will require a bit of discipline on my part of course so let's see how that how that pans out um but yeah in that case it was it was relatively easier for me to make that decision um another thing was i had an option to to go to stanford remotely so that would be online this year um i did not like that option very much to to be honest to say the least simply because there are so many things that you simply cannot do um going to a, a university whether that's stanford or any other university that's really not the point going to a university is about much more than just attending classes and sitting in on lectures um it's the ability to kind of run around the campus when you want to right it's the ability to meet with and talk to the friends that stay in your same residence halls or in your same dorms right it's the ability to go um on to like fishing trips to nearby lakes it's the ability to go and visit the city when you want to to attend political rallies when you want to to attend concerts around when you want to um it's the ability to conduct research in labs when you want to right and there are there are a lot of other things it's the ability to join student organizations create model rockets and fly them randomly in the day when you want to right so it's a, it's a lot of other things that are that go beyond just sitting inside the classroom and that experience would naturally have been lost by by a large degree so i didn't really want to be in a situation which was or a position that was so restricting to me so in my case it was i mean i'd say fairly a straight forward decision that i did not want to pay a lot of money to kind of just sit at home the entire time and learn what i can learn through other means right i can learn it through online courses and stuff like that so apart from the reasons that you gave has it uh, like helped you gain some perspective this gap year and have you achieved more than you wished you could um i would say it's actually very very early in my gap year at this point um i just i mean i wouldn't say it's very early but it's been quite early i really just decided to take 
a gap year in in July or so. So it hasn't been extremely long since I started. But yes, I would say there is there is some better understanding of what I really want to do right now in my one year also and and in the future as well. Um. like i gave you that one example of that internship which really taught me that i don't want to work at a corporate organization that somewhat you know that's a way your gap year can also unfold where you try different things and you know that this is what you want to do or this is not what you want to do and that's that's quite important um for example i just um randomly applied for this one a fellowship in private equity that was uh, i mean conducted by a by a fairly large private equity firm in the us and i i I received the fellowship so i'll be joining their fellowship batch in uh, september now early september second week or so so that's i mean that's something that i would not have been able to do naturally had i gone on to start college right uh, um so whether i like it or whether i'll not will might just decide whether i even want to consider going to private equity as a potential career option in the future so that's that's making a a small difference or a, or a large difference depending on how you look at it in the long run definitely um and in general yeah there there's a lot more time to yourself normally once again what happens is when you're in a when you're in a formal school structure or a, or a guideline structure um you kind of have a lot of the day is like kind of dictated by someone else you can say right it's dictated by your schedule is dictated by the meetings that you have or the appointments that you have or stuff like that and there's not a lot you can do spontaneously because after all if you have to wake up at 6:30 every day and go to school at i mean i genuinely don't remember what time it starts 7:30 or so right um so when you have to do that and and you have to like end that school day at 2:30 or 3:30 and then come back home right on on one specific day for whatever reason if i decide today i want to learn how to how to let's say uh figure out a cloud computing interface and i want to learn it today for some reason right there has to be no reason sometimes you just want to do something right but you can't do that anymore because because there's going to be that a little bit of a, a dictated structure for you and that's is definitely important in the in the early years when um uh, really you aren't very sure about what are things that you should do which are good for you or not good for you because right now i'm giving you the example of oh i want to figure out a cloud computing interface that could also turn out to be oh right now i want to binge watch dark on netflix right and then that doesn't turn out to be so so productive or so useful as the as the previous one but in general because you have a lot of time to yourself now i've had a lot of time to myself in the gap year so it's uh, i think you can say you develop a much more intuitive and well rounded understanding of what your goals are and where you'd like to be um towards the end and it's also helped me in one slightly different way which i didn't expect which is um a, a most most of the students along with me who got into stanford are really attending remotely whether they are from india or abroad right uh, or in the us so when i'm not attending remotely it's almost this nagging feeling that i have in my head man they got a one year head start ahead of me so i have to do everything that i can in this one year to maximize every single second and minute of time that i have so that um i'm not really lagging behind <laughs> as such so that's and that's another i'd say motivating or driving factor that's worked quite well for me and helped me be a little bit more productive so before we go to the questions i would like to say do you have any basic or general advice for the young listeners who want to go abroad for st- uh, the study um yeah so the one thing i uh, i'll say the one most important like specific piece of advice rather than just abstract is i'll say and i cannot stress this enough is that you do not possibly know everything there is to know about this college admissions process the fact is neither do i and neither does anyone else like including officers who read your who read your application um so the thing is you you may think that you do not but you really need as much help as you can get right and the specific piece of advice that i'll give you to do that is really to get a counselor right whether that's a school in school counselor uh, if some schools offer them i'm not i'm not personally aware admissions counselors right um you should get them they are they they can be very useful whether in school is is also acceptable i'm not saying you have to spend lots of money to get one privately from the outside or if if there is there is some kind of uh, i mean depending on what kind of school system you are in if that's not available then you should try your best if it's if it's possible for you financially and otherwise to get a, get an external counselor um to help you with your application right because um 
everybody likes to think that they that they know everything there is to know um i thought the same i'll just i'll say very honestly and at that time lots of my seniors kept telling me you do not possibly know everything there is to know exactly what i'm telling you and i didn't really believe them until i met a counselor who really knew a lot more right and even then the counselor is not going to tell you everything nobody is really going to tell you everything um you really have to kind of take in and absorb and imbibe as many different points of view as you can um speak to experienced people but also speak to inexperienced people because they think of things that experienced people have kind of auto rejected in their heads right so take in all of those viewpoints and make a, a well rounded reasoned syn- synthesized decision from all of them in the end you should be making your own decision you should not be doing something because a counselor told you to do you should not be doing something because a teacher told you to do you should not be doing something be- simply because anybody told you to do right but you should think hard about why they are telling you to do that right because they are not just saying it because they have no other words to say they didn't look up in the dictionary and find random words and put them together and make a string sentence out of them to tell you that they're saying it for a reason there has to be some reason why if you disagree with them talk to them and figure out why they feel differently than what you feel right because there is something they are thinking about which has not occurred to you yet and that's very very important that you really take cognizance of that and uh, treat that different viewpoint with the utmost respect so that's pretty much what i'll say is you don't know everything but nobody else does either so the real key to knowing as much as possible is to talk to everybody find out why they think what they think that's that will help you a lot in general is what i think okay firstly congratulations those answers were just brilliant and before we open um the we open the floor for the questions our principal is here so ma- ma'am would you like to say anything just just before uh, sen gupta ma'am speaks i'd like to add that um, i'm obviously happy that all of you are here but more than anything i'm happy that sen gupta ma'am is here um simply because even today i mean i've had i've had a different principal at the different school i went to after after vidya valley right but if somebody says the the phrase principal ma'am it's her face that pops up in front of my eyes and i don't think that can be changed anytime in the future thank you hardik for a really wonderfully conducted expressed opinion and i'm sure the children who have heard you will take note of what you said i liked you saying we must find out the why of things again i liked you saying that i must find out during my beginning years what i like doing what i enjoy doing so that i can carry it on for the decades where i am working i also liked you saying that i like to work in a small in entrepreneurship because i think you can make a difference over there and definitely you have done very well hardik and i congratulate you and wish you well wherever you go one request is keep in touch with vidya valley because i think that i take a small credit for where you have reached yes absolutely thank absolutely. you as you should and thank you and man and the children what a wonderfully conducted show that you have put up i am sure this initiative is the first of its kind and i'm sure it will go on to gain a lot of popularity you got the first person for the interview wonderfully so humbly expressed thank you children and my love to all of you thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you for being here all right so um would you like me to start with the i mean directly with the questions from the chat month yeah we can do that okay. okay do you want to read them out or should i go ahead uh anything I, i'll read them out if you want okay cool cool go ahead so that you can kind of figure out what order you want to go in which question you want to so i think you've got some questions on personal chat i'm not sure yeah so i have just... some on personal ch- all right all right so i'll just start with those then okay a okay. lot of them are on personal chat because yeah, there's only one in public okay 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 so um yeah like priyansh previously asked did you apply earlier regular i'll i'll address this in a little bit i said previously that i applied regular 
Um, now, early obviously depends. I mean, for those of you who are aware of how the U.S. admission system works, you can apply to usually only one private college early, and um, depending on that college's specific policy, it may be binding or not binding. Binding meaning if you are accepted, you are legally obligated to attend, unless there are financial concerns which are stopping you. Right? That's that's the only pretty much the only exception that they'll make, or unless you are attending university in a different country. Um, so I personally did not apply early because once again, as the name early suggests, mm -hmm. the application um, timeline is is a little bit, um, I'd say, stacked earlier. So the deadline for that usually comes up uh, on the first of November, as opposed to that, the deadline for regular comes um, around the first of January or the first week of January. So in my personal case, I did not apply for early because I mm -hmm. at that time was not confident um, in terms of how well I had put together my application mm -hmm. because um, as much as it is important, as much, as much as the contents of your application are important, obviously the way you present it is equally important, right? So the, the way you deliver that content is, is integral and I wanted to work on that. I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied with my essays. My letters of recommendation had some problems. So a lot of different, different factors that stopped me from applying early. Um, but once again, there is, I'd say a little bit of a, I'd say of somewhat of a myth that applying early kind of gives you a big advantage and you'll have a better chance of getting it. Um, unless it's a binding program in which in most cases in which it is, if there is a binding program, it might probably help you a little bit, right? Because in that case, the college knows for a fact that if they accept you, you are going to attend simply because you're legally bound to do so. And you're telling them that, right? Um, but for four or five schools, I'll just name some that I remember. It's um, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, um, right? These have, uh, these don't have binding programs, which means that even if you are accepted, you are not obligated to attend. In that case, it's probably not making a difference at all, whether you apply early or regular. Um, so once again, to really figure out what kind of college, college is fitting well with, with your overall application and personality, uh, you should really be speaking to a counselor because it's uh, really something that you have to look at from a case to case basis in, in each individual situation. Um, so that was the first question, early or regular. Um, after that, I have, I have another question from uh, Megha Nivsarkar, who's asking, uh, how does the ethos of BVS, which is reading and sports, help you in your university life? And it absolutely very much does, right? Um, so naturally, I mean, if, if you are like me and love to kind of do as much of work as possible, like I say, I call it work. I don't really call it studying because... Uh, the focus is on doing things and not learning things. Uh, you learn by doing indirectly. So that, that works out in the end. Um, in that case, what really happens is that since the stuff you're doing is, I'd say, so gratifying that you kind of don't want to stop doing it. And when you stop doing it also, you should be spending the time in a way you love. And I think one of those ways is really by... Um, being active in terms of sports and, and stuff like that. So I was, I was involved in sports, even in my second high school, I was uh, playing basketball there as well. Um, so that's, that's just one of the things. And uh, like I said previously, in terms of general advice that I gave, uh, read a lot. Uh, this was, I think, answered as part of the entrepreneurship question. There's pretty much no way that can go wrong in terms of reading. That's just foolproof. It helps every single way, regardless of whether you see its application today or whether you do not. So I think, I think it's definitely very, very helpful. Um, and this question asks, is it, uh, does it help in your university life? Probably and almost definitely yes, but um, it almost definitely helps even beyond that and even before that. So um, I don't think, I don't really think you can go wrong with sports and reading um, as long as you um, make sure you prioritize that and your other activities and balance them out correctly. Um, then uh, there's a question from uh, Sen Gupta. I'm asking, is your SOP the most important part of your admission? Um, I, I would not say that with a large amount of certainty. Once again, it really depends from, from college to college. If I'm not wrong, in terms, of, um, um, in terms of Stanford admissions, their own questions, which they have, like I said, there are 11 different essays that they have. Um, they actually give those 11 essays a lot of importance. But a lot of other colleges won't give their essays as much as as much importance as Stanford does. So um, I'll have to say to a large extent, it depends on 
how your essay is compared to the rest of your application um it will depend on what university you are att like up attending or applying to um so i i don't think i can say that with certainty that it is or is not the most important part because as as i previously said uh, nobody really knows everything and i generally don't know this um right i hope that that answers your question now um all right so i have i have a next question from i have two questions from rohan k all right uh, do you recommend going to ib schools instead of cbse schools for 11th and 12th grade if you're planning to go to the us and where did you go right so i i did go to an ib school in mumbai i went to singapore international school for all of those who are wondering it is it is in north mumbai um i once again i would not say that that's some kind of blanket advice that you have to follow that you have that you should go to an international school there's i wouldn't say there's anything like that you can do just as well in a cbse school or an isc school or or even a state board school right the reason i preferred an ib school was because at the time i was under the impression that um going to an ib school would make it easier for an admission officer to exactly understand my academic structure and like how rigorous it is and that is definitely true it it does make it easier for admission officers to understand but there are also a bunch of other other factors that come into play right which i did not uh, which i wasn't aware of at the time but i'll i'll just list out some of them for example um just the way the ib curriculum is structured it means you have to do a lot of other stuff other than just being in classes right so those are a lot of research papers which are just academic requirements and you have to go home and do them on your own right it's it's um a lot of sports and other socially conscious activities and a lot of school events which come in which you have to do to fulfill like creative creativity activity service requirements which is a part of the diploma program right and that that the time commitment and all of that adds up to a much much higher number than what i understand a cbsc or isc or state board time commitments um, like sum up to so that that's definitely a factor that comes into play but but i will not say that one over the other has a significant advantage once again you kind of have to look at how how each of them suits you um but but i will i will add a note here um the admission officers who are responsible to read your application they are assigned by region right which means that everybody in india in fact at least for stanford everybody in south asia so that's india pakistan nepal bangladesh sri lanka and i believe bhutan right all uh, all applications from this country are really read by the one same like principal uh, application reader for this for the south asia region and that person is going to be trained and well aware of uh, how the different academic systems in these countries work so they are going to be aware of how cbse works they are going to be aware of how isc works and the state boards work and si simply because they are they are aware and cognizant of what different different students or different student groups what different difficulties they have what different advantages they have it's going to be relatively kind of um uh, i'd say a balancing factor for everybody it's not like you have an advantage in either case so so that's what i'll say it's um you should really look at it on the basis of what system fits you better in in my case i am all i was almost definitely certain that the that the ib system suit me better simply because i like the more fast paced system and more um focus on action kind of system that that they had so you will have to kind of look at that again from a case to case basis um now i have a question again from from same rohan ki how did you learn enough to do an internship at a company before even attending college well uh, that's the thing i've i've addressed this in short um, i really didn't i had to really go there and my internship was about a month long or i think i think 6 weeks long so one and a half month and i had to go there and for the first week pretty much just look around and read everything i could so that I, so that i understood if exactly what was going on without asking asking somebody every single question that came to my mind right so i so that's what i did for my first week um you will likely not know anything when you get into an internship at least at the high school level depending on what internship at least for technical internships you will likely not know anything and that's all right i don't really think there's a way around that you kind of just have to go there and muscle through it until you eventually come out of it where you have have learned a lot of things right so that's pretty much the only the only thing i can i can say for that um right next question from priyansh lakotia again this is a this is a very straightforward question what other universities did you get accepted to 
and yeah once again to be honest that that's not a very big list i'll just name the i think the top four other than other than stanford that was ucla which is the university of california in los angeles um, and duke university and usc which is the university of southern california and georgia tech right now all of these are i mean relatively reputed universities they are they're well known pretty much at least in the us if not around the world um uh to be honest i actually expected to be accepted to many many more universities that did not turn out as well as i thought it would um and according to my counselor that's what i've been told this was really because of the pandemic there were some restrictions by the us state department in terms of i mean how many uh, like the quotas on international students that they have or may not have so that there, there were a little bit of problems over there which is why across the board not just at my school but nearly across all of the i mean the schools that i know or the students that i know across mumbai and pune at international schools i really spoke to the most of them and acceptance numbers at top schools did decline across the board like i said so i unexpectedly i was i was rejected at most places i did not expect that so that that was a bad bad day for me um because on that on that one day i believe on the 26th of march i was expected to get a uh, nine university decisions and i was expecting um based on what i had spoken to with my counselor who was who is very very experienced we were kind of expecting about seven acceptances and two rejections right and if i'm not wrong it was actually two acceptances and seven rejections on that day so that was pretty much devastating i thought oh man i've done all of this work for two years and it's kind of um not really amounted very well in terms of the results even though i may have learned a lot in the process so luckily the next day is when stanford came out and that was a relief so that turned out well and um of course this was a, this was a one time thing um i'm not even sure really if if this concept of this quota being reduced or anything is right maybe i just didn't get it normally but um, as long as it worked out in the end i really don't have anything to complain about is what i say um now there's another question from yashodhan where did you go from where did you go for counseling um so i went to a counselor in mumbai uh, to a counselor called viral doshi he is among the uh, more well known counselors in in the city i think among pretty much the most reputed and the top counselor there um, i'll just put down his name in the chat if you would like uh, it's viral doshi he is quite selective i had a hard time getting an uh, getting getting like in to his counseling thing anyway uh but you can definitely try to contact him you will probably find him through a quick google search or something like that right if you, if you are interested so that's that's that uh tanishka chupade if i'm saying that right i'm sorry if i'm not um is in your opinion is having a well rounded application better than being a master at one thing in specific and it just cuts off with does sports so i'll i, I assume that was by mistake but i'll address the first part having a well rounded application is not better in my opinion um that's simply because once again um the thing is universities don't want i say it this way universities don't want well rounded students they want a well rounded class right and that's very important to put into perspective uh because a bunch of well rounded students means that if if let's say stanford was to have some kind of competition with harvard right and there there are a bunch of well rounded students at one university the thing is none of them are really specialists at one thing and that causes a lot of problems when you look at the entire class and they want to look at the entire class so they they will want to see uh, you be a master at one specific thing that's an excellent question in fact to ask um in in college admissions jargon they often call it spike right so rather than have just being a plain circle well rounded you should have a spike in one place right so that's the one thing about you that is like absolutely different from anybody else and that's that's what you're fabulous at in my case that spike ended up being like road safety in the specific case right so as as i mentioned um now i don't i don't know what this next question was supposed to be does sports so i'm going to hope it's been corrected somewhere below or i'm going to ask that you correct it somewhere below and i'll answer that to you um thank you for your comments and appreciations swapnesh um thank you okay there are lots of thank yous okay thank you to all of you <laughs> okay um okay um i have a question from rashmi on behalf of jaden who says hi jaden here just wanted to ask how did you go about choosing which stream to pursue um to be honest i am not entirely sure what like the question is is here 
um, because in the, in the IB program, at least or in the international background, I'm not required to choose a stream in terms of science, commerce, or arts. So I did not have to choose a stream specifically. Um, in case you are wondering about um, what major I am pursuing and how I decided that, that's a slightly different uh, situation. Um, in that case, I'll recommend that you really have to look at your overall application and see how um, um, all of your achievements and accomplishments and strong points kind of match with some of the majors that the university offers. In my case, that major was mechanical engineering, right? Now, once again, I'll say, don't blindly do this. Different universities have different policies, but at Stanford, the policy is um, when you apply, you only indicate an intended major and you can change your intended major after, after two years at the university. Right? Uh, I mean, you don't really change. Sorry. You just declare a major by the end of your second year. Um, so really that major that you put on your application, at least at Stanford is just an idea for them to really understand what kind of things you're interested in. It's not a hard and fast thing. So that's why I applied for mechanical engineering. And as, as I think has already been covered, that's really not at all what I'm doing anymore because at that time I really was interested in mechanical engineering, but after that internship also in a way, I kind of realized that it's not really my thing. So that's, that's what happened. Um, let's see. Okay. There's a question from Avantika, which is who's asking, did sports make a difference in your academics? Um, I, once again, I do not genuinely understand how exact, what exactly this, this specific question is asking in terms of making a difference in my academics. So I will say it did not make a difference in my academics. Um, I will say that pursuing sports or like having some kind of, um, backup act, like physical activity definitely helps in terms of overall health and well being. So you will be, um, I'll say more, more enriched and more revitalized at all times to do when you're, when you're really focusing on your academics or on your work or stuff like that. So it does make a difference that way. Um, if the question is about sports making a difference in my admissions, I will go ahead and say it probably did not because once again, they're looking for something that I'm, I'm excellent at. Right. And although I may have participated in, in school sports, that's not something I'm excellent at or marketing as something I'm excellent at. Um, I'm just saying this is also among the many things I do. It's just somewhere on the side that I'm doing it. It's just, it just goes to show that I'm pretty much doing a bit of everything, but still like that spike over there. So that was kind of what it was. If you really want sports to make a, make a difference in your admission process, um, that's a very, very competitive thing, at least at us universities, because they like to recruit students who are excellent at like their sport. Um, in which case you should probably reach out to their admission office or to their athletics department, maybe a year or two in advance and ask them to like, like scout you or something like that. I'm, I'm genuinely not sure how that works. Once again, um, you, I think you would like to speak to a counselor about this, but, um, only, only when that's the case where you are like representing your country at the international level or representing your state at the national level or a, or a much higher level like that, that's when sports really makes a difference in your admissions decision. Right. Um, so that's kind of what happens. And on a side note there, it, it is a little bit intimidating in terms of, at least at Stanford, I believe they've produced the most, um, Olympic athletes of, of all time. And there are students who are coming in who are like already participating in the Olympics. So like an example of that, that is often quoted is Katie Ledecky, who is, um, almost, I'd say unarguably the, the number one female swimmer of all time. Right. And there's just talks all the time about Katie Ledecky was sitting two desks in front of me in the, in the CS class. Right. Um, so that's definitely a very, very competitive scene and you should, um, definitely look at how you fit into that by speaking to the admissions department and athletics department beforehand. Um, could you, this is from Mun. uh, could you explain what is recommended between JEE and international U S colleges for undergrad admission? Now, once again, I don't exactly understand what you're asking, um, recommended between, could you, could you please clarify? Man? What do you think should be chosen between them? Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, once again, that's, that kind of, um, ends up on, on to like a personal level. It really depends on what you, what you personally are more interested in. Um, to be honest, that is what I was, that's what I was uh, in going for. Uh, initially I was going to, uh, I mean, after 10th grade, join a GE coaching class and go down that route. But, um, 
I just realized that that moment at the right moment, I would say that that is that is not the thing for me. And uh, for a lot of you, it it might be the same. And for a lot of you, you might think that that is the right place for you to be. So it once again really depends on your your personal preference. I will really not recommend one over the other. Um, I will say in terms of in terms of technical skills, if that is what you are really really interested to develop, um, and if you're kind of don't want to get into a lot of other stuff, just that one one um, I'd say tunnel vision kind of goal. If you have that, then you should then you might want to go for JE. That might be a better fit there. But if you want to kind of uh, explore things a little bit more more holistically and um, kind of um, look at other things and non-traditional routes and um, unconventional paths, then I think going to international uh, admissions might be might be a better idea for you. Okay. Uh, good specific questions from Pushkar Devasthali, if I'm saying that right. Once again, I'm sorry if I'm not. Is taking AP exams necessary if you want to apply abroad? Um, no, it's not necessary. So the question is asking very specifically if it's necessary, it's not necessary. Um, personally, I took them. If you ask me today why I took them, I genuinely don't have an answer. I think it was it was absolutely unessential or useless for me to take them. Um, at least being in the international curriculum, what happens is once again, like I said, simply because they're more admission officers are more well versed with that system. They don't really need uh, to see anything else. Like they are, they understand perfectly well what what score what a specific score means in the IB system, right? Um, so in that case, I'd say APs are not necessary. Um, just to add on, I think I, I just kind of jumped to answer this question immediately. Uh, for those of you who are unaware or still contemplating international admission, the AP exams are advanced placement. It's conducted by the college board, which is the same nonprofit organization, which conducts the SAT. Um, and they're essentially, you can say like subject specific board exams. That's, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, I studied for them on my own. Once again, that's, that worked out very well for me. Uh, I got like perfect scores there out of five, right? A grade of one to five. I got perfect scores on all my five AP exams, but I will not say that that's something you have to do. It's just, I, it worked for me. So it worked for me and it might not have worked for me just like it did. So, um, once again, that's something you should look, you should look at more in detail in terms of what system you are in. If you are in the state board or CBSE or ISC system, I would, I would say that there is probably a larger benefit of taking the AP exams. But genuinely speaking, if you're doing IB or A levels, which is the UK international curriculum, I do not think you really need to take AP, right? Um, but once again, this is something you want to look at from a personal context. If you have a counselor, you should speak to them. I will say that taking APs or uh, equivalent international exams, so the IB is also considered an equivalent international exam and so are A levels. Um, they do give you college credit in a way, which means that, um, uh, you can really take these exams and kind of skip some classes when you go to campus. Right now, for example, I've taken AP calculus BC, which is their most advanced math exam. So what that means is when I go to campus, I will automatically be able to skip the introductory calculus classes, right? I already get the credit or the requirement. I've already met that and gone past it. So I can skip to more advanced classes. That's, that's one of the advantages that is there. That's, that's a bit of what else. Um, Right. Uh, now Pushkar, I think is asking again, yes. How much financial aid are you receiving from Stanford? And the answer is none because I did not apply for financial aid. Um, Stanford is one of the schools which is need aware in terms of admissions for international students, which means that asking for aid actually may, uh, like kind of reduce your chances to get accepted to the university. Right. I think I can list five schools if I'm not wrong, who are need blind, which means Asking for it does not affect your chances. Um, that's Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Amherst College, and MIT, right? Those are the five colleges. Now those are naturally very, very selective. And I did apply to all of them and I did apply to all of them with aid. Unfortunately, I was not able to um, get into any of them. So that, that did not work out so well for me. Um, at Stanford, however, I did not apply for aid. And so naturally I can get that. 
um yeah tanish tanishka has also asked us sport okay yeah so she's corrected that question does sports play an important role and i think i've i've addressed that already you know in a question that came after that thank you for your question tanishka um okay man is asking okay man and meek are both asking one by one did you give the sat or act and why and if you did was it important right so i'll start with was it important the answer is uh to most colleges it's a requirement at least it was in my year i understand that's changed now for for maybe one or two years because i understand that the the pandemic is kind of preventing gatherings of large sizes so not everybody can take the act or the sat depending on what part of the world they're in um, i personally don't know what the situation is in india i have not gen- like honestly speaking i have not been keeping up to date with with news about whether centers are still open or closed um so this year for the sake only for this year they are test optional which means you have an option whether you want to take and submit the test or whether you do not want to right but in in normal years that's not an option um you have to take one of them and you have to submit them that's a requirement if you want your application to even be reviewed right most of these colleges use digital like admission review system application review system and it means like if you didn't um oh man just sent me a thing saying <laughs> i just saw that man i'm sorry but i will just keep going on i think because i'm pretty much done um right sorry so uh yeah what i was saying is uh if if you don't submit any part of your application which is either the whole application of course or your lors or the uh, essays or the or any required test scores your application just automatically gets thrown out by the system because it's not complete right and an act or sat is required i personally took the act why did i take the act because i am personally more um confident in terms of a uh, limited time systems right when when the when the clock is ticking i i'm better at that so maybe that's just my thing i work better under pressure i believe and just just as an overall like difference of why that means the act is better for me is because um i i like to say it this way the sat always has more minutes than questions and the act always has more questions than minutes right so the number of questions is fixed but in each section that that is fixed right so it means the act is going to require much more speed so rather than really um okay before that they're con- they're graded on curves which meaning um your score kind of depends on how the other people in your test uh, test session do also right because that's how they standardize it that's why that's how they know that one test is not more difficult than an, than another right so rather than looking at whether in the end i'm going to get a good score or not it's really am i going to get a good score compared to the other people who i'm taking the exam with and because i'm doing well under under limited time conditions and under pressure conditions what that simply means is i'm going to do better than the other people there who are not doing so well <laughs> in limited time conditions so that's the way i looked at it and it and it worked out for me um so that's why i did the act um and i believe that's the last question here from sakshi arjun asking is it better to apply for fall or spring i think i would undoubtedly say it has to be a fall uh, most colleges in fact i don't even think have a spring intake i am not certain of i do not believe they do at least some colleges have only that one one fall system now um, very few colleges have a spring intake if they do that's going to be much much smaller than the size of the fall intake so if for whatever reason you want to do that you should definitely look at and be sure of what your college policies are beforehand otherwise i i'd see no reason why you would want to apply to spring instead um taking that into consideration and fall also kind of aligns well with the um i'd say overall timeline of educational systems across the world right so it's somewhat like you graduate in um i'm not sure when that happens in in other schools but in the ib you graduate in about late may or june early june and then you can go to a uh, college in september right so that's uh, that's just a few months of gap that you have in between that's kind of the perfect slot there and then after that you can go uh, compared to that spring will start somewhere in january or february depending on the college and that means after you graduate in june you're going to have to wait for 6 or 7 months before you before you go there so i would almost definitely say that's that should be for and that's the end of the questions and yeah man actually sent me a message quite a while ago that was about 6 to 7 minutes ago saying uh, we exceeded a, uh, we went past the time we went overboard a lot so i'm sorry about anybody uh, i'm sorry in terms of anybody i kept waiting here but still uh, thank you for showing up and listening to me 
Well, this was a really nice evening. Um, Hardik, thank you so much for joining us today. And Nalini ma'am, thank you for all your support. We really appreciate it. And to all the audience, thank you so much for attending this. It was, it, it, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see you forward in more events like this. And Hardik, best of luck. I hope you really do well. And I know you will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to the organizing team as well. Thank you for having me. It's um, the highlight of this day for me was when I was called great at the beginning of the session. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, honestly. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Good luck to all of you. Um, I think I think I'm going to send them or send the team some of the links that I have um, about some of the projects and the work that I've done. So if you want to look at those in detail, you can. Um, yeah, I think, I think that will be a lot of, lot of information um, that you can look at. If you guys have any other questions, y'all can uh, DM it on Instagram to Haikyuu and we'll uh, pass it over on to Hartik. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks, Bye-bye. Okay, all right. Even I'm going to head out and leave the meeting now. Great to be here. Bye. Thanks for having me again. Bye. The request for our IQ members to stay back after everyone leaves. Yes, Congratulations! That was great. Varun, leave. You're not part of it. Dude, man. Yeah? You can't just ask me at the last minute to say something. Hey, okay. See, it was awesome, by the way. We got like 63. Exactly. Yeah, man. Got, oh, congratulations, yeah. But I messed up at the start like too much. No, you didn't actually. No, guys, no, it was. I went too fast. I it was an overall <laughs> good thing. You know, for for our first attempt, this was really good. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now let's like think about the second speaker or something. No, no, no. I yeah. think we need to talk about what mistakes we did in the first time. Um, okay. So I think I'll I'll own up. Everyone should own up on their own mistake. I'll, I'll go first. I think I went a bit too fast with the intro. And next time, I think whoever is doing the intro should memorize it a little, so we don't have to look down and stuff like that. I think um, that's better. Uh, I yeah. do... Same thing, guys. Yeah. When you're talking, look loud. Yeah, I agree with Alice. Keep memorize everything, and also let's not say um and all of that. Like, so after you ask the in questions, in all I can do is such a like assembly presentation. We were trying to, you know, memorize everything and say it. Yeah. No, okay, guys, one thing I observed, like, Man and I were talking about was, um, after he answered, you guys just said, okay, and went to the next question. You have to make him feel good that he's answered well. Like, that's one mm -hmm. key. Yeah, 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 like, that's a good answer or something like that. Because yeah. he was appreciating our questions. So we should have done the same. Man, you can stop the recording first. Oh, yeah. We were recording. Yeah. Uh, I hardly want to. Please, please cut the recording to us. Okay, please. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Like ASAP. Out.